Hello my soccer universe. In my opinion the Euro started out really well and bright and attacking and now it becomes the Euros of the defensive and the turgid games yesterday overall was not a fun day to watch. And yes I think the two teams that deserved it more went on. And yes, Slovenia put in an absolute masterclass in defending and probably would also have deserved their win because, you know, as a small nation, if you defend that well and that clinically, that would have been deserved too. But the tournament over is becoming a little bit meh. I have actually some high hopes for today's games. There might be some goals in there. But if it wasn't for Spain, uh, Austria, Turkey, Georgia, uh, these teams, I think it would be a very subpar Euros overall. And that's not a great thing. We had France being France, the the Jean France that we know, not the France that we expect. Just keeping it tight, being solid, and in the end winning it by an own goal. They still have not scored by themselves a goal from open play. That's a staggering statistic. So if you just look at the squad play, but they get the result similar to England. At least it looks a little bit more cohesive than England. And I don't know what to say about Portugal. I mean, the story is all Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo. And that's the problem. You're pandering too much to an aging superstar. And the tears at halftime really could tell that he's seeing in front of his eyes that his greatness is not there anymore. And he should actually step back into a secondary role where he still can help his team quite a lot with all his experience and his class and whatever, his work ethic. But he don't play 120 minutes. As soon as Rafa Leao, the next superstar for Portugal. And as a Milan fan, I know you love him and you hate him. But as soon as he came off, the attack became very stale and very static. And I wonder, what was Martinez thinking here? The same thing can also be said for the Belgium coach Tedesco. De Bruyne as a holding six, playing long balls over to Lukaku, completely passing by your best player. Don't think this makes a whole lot of sense. But before we talk about these games, Jersey matchup bingo. I got it right. I got it right. I knew that France, despite being the home team, has to play in white against Belgium in red because it's the only thing you get proper contrast between these two teams. That the pants then were kind of a little bit of a clash, you know, blue with black. I take to the side, but I got it right. I knew, I looked at it. How can France play in blue jerseys? They can't. The Belgian home jerseys are too dark and the away jersey is light blue. Just doesn't work. Portugal against Slovenia was, of course, the expected one. And yes, I was also happy that for the France Belgium matchup, we didn't see color blocking. Because that is also something I expected. But yeah, that was for me the highlight of the evening in a way. Nah, I shouldn't say that. Uh, there was plenty of drama in the Slovenia Portugal game. But I'm going to start in Dusseldorf with France against Belgium. Honestly, there is not much that I can tell you. I mean, I had a very nice summer in the one minute <laughs> video that I published yesterday. It was France keeping it tight, France keeping the ball, circulating the ball around however with not much speed. And Belgium deciding, okay, how do we play against France? And Kevin De Bruyne said it later, this France team is really good. They make you play a certain way and you have to adapt to that and you have to find what you could do. And Belgium, unlike 2018, opted for a very negative approach, you know, 4-4-2, but very flat, all on the back. And as I said, you know, you have the target man Lukaku up front and you bounce it off and De Bruyne is kind of caught in the middle. And for me, this is something really sad to see because I really love De Bruyne. He never plays for the right teams, but he's an absolute class player, a player that I love watching. And so France controlled most of the game, Belgium hitting here and there on a counter-attack. I think there were only a few chances, France barely hitting the target. If you look at the stats, France had only two shots on goal, but they had overall 18 shots. So, you know, there were a few Thuram headers that went over the bar. I think that Mbappé had a shot that went wide. Mbappé, of course, with his mask. Now the new one that has some holes in there, so the sweat doesn't get in. He absolutely detests the mask, but he has to wear it. So that doesn't work out for him either. In any case, I think the best chances though fell to Belgium. There was a free kick by De Bruyne that Mike Mignon makes an absolutely unorthodox save, you know, falling back somehow. Then there was one, I think Carrasco was through with Teo Hernandez, it was already in the second half, and just tackles from behind, gets the ball off him, and then having the fist bump with his Milan teammate Mike Mignon. 
That was probably Belgium's best chance. And then there was also a De Bruyne shot around the 82nd minute where he was free at the edge of the box. There was only one defender. He had actually more or less a free go, but he couldn't place it well. And Marc Mignon saved once more. Belgium had as many shots on goal as France. But the XG also tells a story. I mean, France took 18 shots. It has an XG of 1.36. Belgium with two shots has an XG of 0.2 roughly. So yeah, <laughs> it was not a great watch. Unless you like to see France really death by a thousand cuts. And that's exactly how the winning goal came. Colomiani had come on meanwhile for Marcos Thuram. Lukaku loses the ball at the edge of the opposing box. And then France, pass, 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 but not in a rapid, fast motion. However, they pass it around, they stretch the Belgians, Belgium becomes very passive. And then Conte, I think, plays a ball out to Jules Koundé, and I'm thinking, he's completely stopping the momentum right there. He's stopping, he could have played it on a little bit earlier, but he's stopping, da, da, da. then he plays it to Colomini, who makes the turn, takes a shot, hits, Hits other foot, but also crucially hits Vertonghen's knee, and it goes in in the 85th minute for a routine France win. And if you're a fan of Belgium, it must be so annoying that your big neighbors once again beat you. And I can feel with Belgium because this is exactly how I feel most of the time when Austria is playing Germany. Very similar dynamic there. It's just super, super, super annoying. It's also annoying to see France play like that, but they look like a perfect tournament team at this point. They have a plan, it's not pretty, but they have class players and they somehow get the job done. That's at least what Deschamps claims and I guess no one can really fault him for that as long as the results are coming. However, I really wish that this France team would for once really show us what they're capable of doing. Usually there is one or two tournament games where at least for a half they put in a shift. So let's see what will happen this time around. Over in Frankfurt, we had a game that had less goals, but a lot more storylines. I said it already in the opener, Slovenia came out to defend and they defended so well. In the end, Slovenia had probably the better chances than Portugal. But it was also becoming absolutely ridiculous how much of a Ronaldo show the whole thing became. And I don't know if this is Roberto Martinez or if it's just Cristiano stepping up and none of his teammates trying to stop him from the folly. I think he took a total of three free kicks, takes him up at big tournaments to 60, he scored one. Yes, that was a brilliant equalizer against Spain in the 2018 World Cup. But ever since he took that goal, he thinks he can yank them in and he's not good at this. And what's even more damning that with Bruno Fernandes and Bernardo Silva, they have at least two players that are much better at taking free kicks. No, but big Cristiano has to ramp up his goal scoring tally. I'm sorry. Yes, goal scoring is important, but this is not who you are as a player. This is what frustrates me with that. And it's all about Cristiano. And this is a team that could be so brilliant. Yes, you saw some glimpses when Leao had his runs and I think he was actually quite good this time around. A really stretching of Slovenian defense has always been an attacking threat. But as soon as the ball comes to Cristiano, it all stops. Because the ball has to come to Cristiano because he has to score his goal. He still hasn't scored a goal at these Euros, which hasn't happened before. Take a hint, father time is knocking. As I said, I think for around 60 minutes, I really felt this will be a routine win for Portugal. Yes, Slovenia were defending well, but with the threat of Leao and, you know, the accurate passing by Bruno Fernandes and Bernardo Silva, you're gonna cut them open. Polinia played well. It was all really well done by Portugal. And then he takes Leao off. Bring on Francisco Conceição. Suddenly you're static. Suddenly you're static and you have the superstar taking the free kicks and bumping into Oblak. Again, I want to give a whole lot of credit for Slovenia because in the end they created the best chances. Šeško having a good chance already in regulation and then also in overtime we get to it. But before that, we of course have to say that over time it really looked to me it had nil nil written all over because suddenly Portugal was a mess. But also they get the penalty. I'm not sure if Diogo Jota was really brought down with it. I think I can see why it was given as a penalty. He was looking for it, but there was also enough contact for it to be there. But it was at least controversial. Cristiano steps up and I've been dissing him now a lot. This was a really good penalty. Maybe the only thing that was not good was that it was like a little bit off the ground. But Oblak makes a great save. And 
as great as a goalkeeper Oblak is, he's not necessarily known for making penalty saves. This was a brilliant penalty save. Cristiano misses it and then the tears are coming. In a way, I can sympathize with him. He felt right there that, yeah, he's not as great of a player anymore as he used to be. And then Pepe, the other old guy, and Pepe actually plays a whole lot better than Cristiano. And, you know, he doesn't play badly. He's just, he's stopping this Portugal team from being something really special. And he should have played 120 minutes, especially if you have a Leao, who is much younger, has to come off after 60 minutes. Rant over. The big chance, Pepe spills the ball to Sheshka, who has a one-on-one -on -one with Diogo Costa. He maybe shoots too early. He tries to take a shot with his better foot, but also Diogo Costa waits, 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 and then dangles out the leg to save that one. That was the big chance for Slovenia. I actually think he should probably have lobbed it or went over to the other side. But I, but I can see if you've played so long and so hard, yeah. It goes to penalties. And that was the shortest penalty shoot I've ever seen because all the penalties of Slovenia were literally the same. The same what Ronaldo did, actually. A little bit off the ground and Diogo Costa every single time jumps actually before the shot is already taken. Slightly before. So he had that and the Slovenian players, as I said, did not take great penalties. All three are saved. Ronaldo, Bruno Fernandes and Bernardo Silva convert. Portugal are through to the next round. Overall deservedly so, but it's so maddening. And now they meet a France team in the quarterfinals where they're super sturdy. Portugal is super sturdy. This has nil-nil written all over. I'm not sure. I'm gonna watch it, but I probably will do something beside that as well. And so if we look at the projected bracket, I mean, there have not been too many surprises so far. Maybe Switzerland beating Italy, but not really. I'm really hoping we'll not see further surprises coming this evening, but it might come. Usually you see at least one upset. We still said, you know, Spain against Germany and then, yeah, Portugal, France sounds great, but usually France wins this one, except it's a Euro final and the lower bracket, we all know how England is favored in that one. I know it might be a fool's hope, but I really have a hope that today's matches deliver us some goals. I mean, there is the feeling there. Romania are a nice team. The Netherlands have a lot to prove and they have a lot of nice players. They just have not a so good coach. I don't want to take down Ronald Koeman too much because he was too great of a player. But as a coach, it just doesn't quite work out. And Austria, Turkey, I'm having a little bit of heebie-jeebies about that one. The 6-1 friendly, that was too high. As I said before, it was a 3-2, maybe a 4 too. But then Turkey is exactly the team that plays into Austria's card as well. Austria is very much a front foot team. Turkey likes to play it out from the back. It's not so solid on the back as well. So the pressing could work quite well. Chalonogl not playing is a huge factor, I think, because that takes the chances of Turkey away. Arda Güler needs to step it up. I expect tons of Turkish fans there. This will be a great atmosphere. As I actually expect also for Romania versus Netherlands in Munich. Yes, I think Austria favorites. But this is what annoys me in this game because Austria perform well when the expectations are not there. But Austria, in my opinion, has achieved already so much at this tournament, more than we ever could expect. I mean, winning that group and getting two wins, you didn't really count on that and also being one of the stories of the tournament that, yeah, even if it doesn't go well, I guess I will be all right with it. You achieved the goal. It was the nothing outstanding. It was just good. And you were a story of the tournament and that is good. You know, I'm always between the optimism that Rangnick is trying to instill into us Austrians and the knee-jerk Austrian reaction of being very pessimistic about things. I don't know where to fall. In any case, I think it should be a fun game if you're not an Austria fan or Turkey fan. In any case, give me a thumbs up. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a line with any of your thoughts on all the games we talked about in here. I will talk to you soon about more things in my soccer universe. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.